So the one, two, three of data sharing agreements. This uh, webinar is being brought to you by the Australian Research Data Commons, the ARDC. For those of you who don't know us, we have a purpose to provide Australian researchers with a competitive advantage through data, with a mission to accelerate research and innovation by driving excellence in the creation, analysis and retention of high quality data assets. Before I begin, I would like to do an acknowledgement of country. So we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And for me, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation here in Sydney. So firstly, some welcomes and introductions. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for coming along to this, this webinar. It's great to have so many people on board and to see the interest that is out there within data sharing agreements. Uh, my name's Robin Burgess and I'm the Research Data Specialist in Data Governance at the ARDC. And I have a real interest in the ways in which we're able to share and reuse data. And I've had many questions since joining the ARDC around the creation of data sharing agreements, which brought about the uh, development of the documents that I wish to share with you today and looking at the potential kind of one, two, three key areas that I think are important when it comes to data sharing agreements. Also, this is an opportunity to hear from those who have created data sharing agreements and have been working with them. So we've got Paula and Jake from the UNS from UNSW and Thomas from Swinburne University who'll be giving their examples. And any of you on the call, if you'd like to share your experiences in chat um, or any comments you have, that would be great. Also, hopefully there'll be time for questions. Um, we'll do questions at the end of all the presentations. And I'm keen to also look at determining what next steps in the area could, could be and any further support you might be looking for from the ARDC. So do use the chat uh, function as a way to, uh, for conversations. But first, what is a data sharing agreement? I'm sure you're pretty much all across what these are, having potentially worked with them. So they can be seen as a legal document and an agreement between individuals or groups wanting to share or access data. They're a tool and document that will help protect the misuse of data from a project. And it can also be said that they're very much tailored for a specific project or organization. There really is no single template for a data sharing agreement. I've added an example here from the ONDC who have been working very heavily with data sharing agreements and they've produced a template uh, to support with the access and sharing of government related data. And tomorrow they will be running a session on data sharing agreements as well. Um, these slides will be shared with you so you'll be able to click on the links that are within, within the present. We're all trying. Um, so uh, data sharing agreements guidelines is the first one that I want to present to you. So within this document, we look at commenting on what a data sharing agreement is, when data sharing agreements are needed, common types of data sharing agreements, the components that consist uh, within the data sharing agreement and how to go about creating a data sharing agreement. <clears throat> so I just want to point out some of the key components of a data sharing agreement, because this has often been a question that I've uh, received. So we can very much look at ideas around the information about the data, the parties and the context of the agreement. So this is looking at details of the data to be shared, the purpose of sharing the data, any time periods affiliated to the sharing of the data, and roles and responsibilities. The next section is related to the actual conditions of sharing. So this relates to what the data could potentially be used for, and if there's any constraints in place with the use. Also sensitivity, security, and retention of the data. Also um, commentary on the methods of how the data will be accessed and actual details around the data, such as formats. 
And then there can be some final sections and aspects related to the agreement to um, include, such as a simple title for the document. You might also want to include aspects related to licensing or copyright conditions. You might have reporting requirements once the data has been shared. And it's also good to comment on risks and variations that might have occurred in, in the data prior to sharing it. So the second document that the ARDC has produced is related to data sharing policies. So within this document, we comment on the types of data and the agent the agencies have in their custody, the principles and strategies around sharing of that data, commentary on governance and management procedures, when the policy might be needed, and once again, key components of the policy. So I'd just like to comment on some of the key components that we list in this document. So the first is related to regulatory requirements, whether there's any other policies that are already in place that Im impact on your data sharing, such as a research data management policy or open access policy. Also commentary on data governance require requirements are important. So this looks at the idea of ethics, roles and responsibilities and access to the data. It also touches upon the actual procedures for accessing the data. So how will the data be accessed and what is the data request uh, procedure? Other aspects include licensing and change management, and also a technical framework might be applied, looking at what technology and tools are out there that will support the data being shared. And also importantly, with regards to data, is understanding the classification of the data, whether it's sensitive data or freely available data. So now we'll just a quick comment on the one, two, three of data sharing agreements. So these are the three key areas that I feel are very important when it comes to understanding and the application of data sharing agreements. So the one. So the first aspect that I'm, I would say you need to consider is, do you actually need a data sharing agreement? So you might actually have data that you might actually just be able to make available through a simple license, or there might be another agreement process that could be in place for the sharing of your data. The second one is to review and understand the components of the data sharing agreement. So those are the areas that I've commented on in this presentation so far. And to look at the creation of a template to support this and to subsequently complete the required sections. And finally, one that I think is really important is that of getting support for the completion of the data sharing agreement document. This support might come from your legal office at your university or organization. And also, you should also have many discussions with those for whom you are wanting to share the data with or receive the data from to ensure that there's compliance and there's agreement with regards to the uh, content of the data sharing agreement. And then finally, ensure that the document gets signed off. And this is most likely to be done by a legal entity. So just finally from me, before we move on to the uh, case studies, um, I'd just like to ask you to kind of comment in the chat and I'll make note of any uh, comments you make, kind of what further support would you require with regard to data sharing agreements? Would you be looking for further guidelines, the idea of templates or examples? And the second question is, what sort of elements of data sharing agreements do you currently find the hardest? Or is there an aspect that you find um, the easiest? So I'd be happy for you to share any thoughts on those questions within the chat. So I will now stop sharing my screen and I will hand over to Paula, Jake and Thomas, who will share their experiences with data sharing agreements. Thank you. And I apologize for the um, slight mishaps with the sharing and stuff that so two of us from UNSW um, myself I work in the data governance area and Jake Sermon who works in research technology and and research data management I'll let Jake explain when you get to him next slide please 
Okay, so data governance at UNSW, we've been doing data governance, first of all, high level, uh, since about um, 2015 when Kate Carruthers, my manager, um, the chief data officer, established the data governance framework. And then the work that came straight out of that was to put together the data governance policy suite. So we've got quite an extensive data governance policy suite as a result. Policy sets out roles and responsibilities, including data ownership. We call it, we call our data owners um, data controllers. Um, so if I slip up and say data owner or data controller, that's what I'm talking about. And also other the role, the policies also talk about quality and integrity, classification and security. We've got a data classification standard. Uh, we have data handling guidelines, which has just recently been superseded by um, a whole suite of cybersecurity standards. Um, we've got data breach policy and procedure, data retention procedure, and a data sharing agreement procedure, which is basically um, just formalizing what we've developed over the past few years. Then within that data governance policy suite, we also have the data governance for research data. And um, so um, Jake, Jake may, may um, touch on those. And then related policies that we have are privacy, record keeping and cybersecurity. So all of those together guide what we do in terms of putting together data sharing agreements, which I'll touch on as we go to the next slide. So with data sharing at UNSW, we have a much more, um, I use the word mature, but it's probably got connotation. We've been doing data sharing agreements for teaching and admin data um, in a centralized way much longer than we have for, for research data, but we're applying the things that work and are relevant in that area to uh, research data as well as Jake will mention. But I thought it's worth taking you through what we've been doing with teaching and admin data. So, um, and we've got about 150 data sharing agreements in place for the teaching and admin data. So basically whenever data um, is going to be used from one of our enterprise systems in another, or if it's gonna be used for an enterprise system in one business unit by a different business unit, then there is a requirement for a data sharing agreement to be put in place. We've been doing this now since, I think I've found some data sharing agreements that go back to 2017, 2018. But I have to say that it's still coming as a terrible shock to some people within the organisation when they hit one of our gatekeepers and um, are asked whether they have a data sharing agreement in place for this. So it's, it's still a very organic process, but that, that's the basis on which we're putting data sharing agreements in place. From one enterprise system to another, from one enterprise system in one business unit to another. And then of course, if we, if we procure or use an external service platform system, what have you, then there must be a data sharing agreement between us and the provider of that service system platform. I mentioned gatekeepers. Um, so we have policies, and as you all very well know, um, it's one thing to have policies and it's another thing to enforce them, and it's a learning experience for everyone. Over time, we've established a set of informal um, gatekeepers that help us to enforce data um, sharing agreements. Of course, the data controllers, the owners, custodians, the system owners, uh, the data providers, cyber, and the research ethics committee. All of those, either in a formal sense or an informal sense, depending on um, the different policies and procedures that are in place, say to someone who's requesting data, do you have a data sharing agreement for that? And if they don't, then they get sent to me. So I am the central point within the university for uh, dealing with data sharing agreements. So they come to me or they use this, um, uh, our SharePoint intranet to request the data sharing agreement. Um, and then I get the process going. 
Next slide, please, Jack. So the the so it is a centralised process. Um, I'm the hub, and uh, basically I then negotiate with and deal with um, all of the um, the other elements that are spelled out here. So the form comes to me first, and we ask them the basic information in high level terms. What's the data that you want? Um, what's the source system? How are you going to transfer it? And how often? What are your user and access controls? Uh, what are you going to be using it for? Are you going to distribute it any further? And how are you going to store it? And where are you going to store it? Uh, so sovereignty is obviously, in, and storage sovereignty is obviously an issue. Um, so the area that I work in, I'm the data governance manager. And myself and my boss are the data governance officer. Uh, once I've gathered that first bit of information, then I will request ad additional information. We need, I'll need a spreadsheet of every single data field that's required because I know that the data controllers will want to see that. We'll look, look at them all. Um, I will help the data user classify all of the data fields. Um, I will determine whether cyber has assessed uh, either the solution that they're using in-house or the solution that's being procured. Um, I will talk to the privacy officer to see if there's any privacy considerations, um, either relating to the data itself or um, the procurement contract. And as I said, I'll uh, I talk to cyber and then I will draft together a data sharing agreement. We have a template, but I've discovered that the template only goes so far and that pretty much every situation requires a bespoke um, data sharing agreement. Having gathered all of that information, then we have an approval meeting. We'll hold it with the data user, the data controller, privacy officer, system owner, um, and, and essentially the data controller interrogates the data sharing agreement and the data user to get to their um, um, comfort that the data will be um, used appropriately or uh, well, for an appropriate purpose, will have the, all of the access controls in place um, and that the system uh, the um, data user understands that they can only use it for the purpose that's been approved in this agreement. Um, generally speaking, the data sharing agreement is then approved um, for three years, that's general. Um, sometimes only for six months if, for example, cyber is still doing penetration testing and is happy to give um, an interim approval but not a long-term approval. So, um, you know, the timing may change. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Jake. I think it's over to you to talk about how, what we do, how we're applying this, these learnings into the research data sharing space. Yeah, thanks, Paula. So I'm from Research Technology Services, as, as Paula mentioned earlier. We have a function within that, which uh, is the Research Data Management Single Point of Contact, rdm at unsw.edu.au. It's just an email address, really. But so that's been our main point of contact with people who want to know about how to do a research data um, sharing agreement. And um, because we've had some inquiries on that, Paula actually wrote a sort of version of her teaching and admin data sharing agreement as a research one. Um, so adding research things and changing bits and using some stuff from other uh, templates that we found. So that's it on the right there. Um, so we have that template. I don't know that, uh, I think we've had one person that asked for it and um, not sure if anyone's actually used it yet. So that was, <laughs> it's been around for a year or so now. But I, I think uh, our main uh, interest, our main sort of contact with these data sharing agreements is that uh, we don't see a lot of them. We're assuming that there are, there are some happening in the background, but it, when we mainly know about them when they uh, come to our email address, when they have some sort of problem or they're asking questions um, uh, about, about us. And then we uh, work with Paula usually to try and figure out what is happening um, and what we need to do to help them out. So um, in my experience, we've been doing this RDM at UNSW for four years, something like that now. And uh, we haven't had too many data sharing agreement um, inquiries during that time. So we have had some and we've uh, usually what has been our experience is that 
people come to us with a data sharing agreement because they're asking for data from probably a government body, a uh, health district, uh, someone like that, and they've brought a template, uh, their own data sharing agreement to UNSW, uh, so they've presented that to UNSW uh, and uh, somebody wants to know some details about how to fill it in. Um, so usually it's not a sharing agreement that we have there, it's well, something that's come in from someone else. They um, have a pre-filled agreement, sometimes it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty good sometimes that's uh, very vague or it's designed for uh, companies to fill out or something like that but uh, we've helped people with fill them in uh, there's some considerations there I think uh, Robin covered a lot of this stuff earlier but that's what we try and make sure is is detailed appropriately in a data sharing agreement and often what happens is that the data sharing agreement is presented to us we, have, we give it a read, it's legalese quite often. And so we have to fix through it and make sure that we're not promising things that we can't do. Um, because we're research technology services, I often are involved in the technical bits about data storage or systems that have to be used, requirements that come from the external people about what systems we're allowed to use, trying to match those with um, requirements that our own cybersecurity and other policies cover so that make sure that we're not sort of conflicting but uh what is that that's ended up being is a negotiation i find it is an interesting output of what that is is that they come with an agreement which looks like a legal thing but it ends up being you know they say oh you have to use this system or that system and um, we can't comply with that because we're a university or we don't have access or the researcher doesn't have a budget or something and so we have to have a back and forth with the um, data controller or the data provider and figure out what we can do and what we're allowed to do and most of the time that's been pretty good sometimes we have had a couple where it's gone it's gone away and never come back so possibly they haven't been able to get the data because they haven't been able to come to terms that were agreeable with their data provider the template that we've got here was created actually when a data provider hadn't done it before and was asking if we had a template that they could use to uh, to form an agreement because they didn't really know how to do it and so we said okay this is what it looks like so it was a a thing that a, a template like with the sort of things that you see there and then they uh, helped the, them and the researcher that was asking for the data filled those out uh, we have had these are the sort of some of the places that we've seen data agreements happen um general bureau of statistics is common ato we've had um there's a consumer data right page, which I've recently been involved with some people trying to get some data from there. Very, it's a very complicated uh, and uh, high requirements for security and systems and and um, certifications from that one, which was interesting. So these people, um, so I think that's been the most of the things that we've got from sort of health districts, a, uh, ABS, and now this consumer data right. So they, those people all sort of brought their own data sharing agreements that we were sort of asked to sign basically, or the researcher was asked to sign. And I just wanted to mention data place because uh, Paul has been doing a lot of work with this and hopefully it's going to be somehow helping us with, with data sharing agreements. Um, it's it's the, the, the Australian government website has uh, not quite gotten online yet but the idea being that you can sign your institution up for it and then uh, the institute uh, government-based data sharing stuff will go through there and we again we sort of ha have had a few people go through Paula um, she can talk more about that if people are interested maybe but uh, to try and use data place for creating data sharing agreements or negotiating data sharing agreements um, but at the moment uh, it's sort of half made so I don't think we have a lot to talk about there yet because it's not quite ready so that's um all I was going to talk about there so maybe we can pass it on to the next um person sure uh, that, that was fantastic thank you Paul and, and Jake for giving an, as an insight into the areas that you're working on with regards to uh, data sharing agreements, what's working, what's not, and the kind of logistics and the number of people who are kind of involved in the process. Um, interesting you mentioned data place there, yeah. Um, 
the ARDC have actually got a data place data accreditation a meeting happening tomorrow at three o'clock. If anyone's interested, I can send you a link to that meeting. It's a support group to discuss aspects around data place and gaining accreditation as a data user within the platform. Um, so at this point, um, as I mentioned, we'll take questions at the end. So I'll hand over to Thomas and hopefully you'll be able to share your screen. Well, let's have a go. All right, so hopefully screen sharing, shout out if I'm not. Looking good. Um, this is gonna be a bit more uh, informal than the last presentation. And I'm gonna focus mostly on uh, a little bit of the process and the outcome of a template that I developed. Um, ironically, before I had seen uh, Robin's really nice data sharing agreement development um, uh, documentation, that's been really interesting. Um, looking uh, at the alignment between it and that document. Um, but this was part of the ARDC's Institutional Underpinnings Project, and I was uh, running part of the policy um, development thread of that um, larger project within Swinburne. Um, and as part of that, uh, initially, the aim was to just put uh, together um, a policy uh, that could be Kind of modular and used between universities and adapted and things like that uh, around research data management. Um, uh, this came out of the fact that Swinburne did not have any research data management policy at all at the time, which is, uh, I think, a big oversight for a university with technology in the name. Um, but as part of that project, it became increasingly clear that actually there was a whole load of ancillary material around it that was needed you know you can't just have a standalone policy and I think everyone knows that it, it um uh if you just have that you are inviting essentially zero percent compliance so um there was also some um guidelines and how to's and FAQs and training material developed around it as well as a whole comms uh, communication package around it um but also a few uh templates and things like that to help people out um, the three sort of relevant templates for, from uh, from this point of view was um, a readme template to describe individual data sets um, or folders or directories of data set, uh, a research data management plan template, um, and a data sharing agreement template. Uh, the reason behind these was because, again, we previously didn't have anything, so we wanted to make sure that we were putting something out there that was relatively uh, easy as a low bar to start with. So for example, our um, research data management plans are not in any fancy system or through a controlled form. They are Word documents, which many universities have previously had and then moved on from. So this is you know starting from a relatively low bar, but the benefit, I guess, from, from, the point of, from, from that point of view is that Word documents um, have quite a useful balance of being able to have, you know, controlled areas where people enter information, but also being highly adaptable. And it's already been mentioned by basically everyone who's previously spoken. Um, you can't have a strict data sharing agreement template. There's always going to be the particularities of the data set or the signatories that essentially mean that all of, uh, even if you start out with a template, it'll inevitably be significantly edited since then. Um, so as part of this, I went out and I started sniffing around the internet to see if I could find some Creative Commons license um, sharing agreements, because that would save me a whole load of um, trouble if I could just adapt an existing data sharing agreement template. Um, and I'll just do a reshare screen, actually, um, because I, I ended up with this folder full of data sharing agreements that I pulled from uh, around the internet. Um, but interestingly, uh, they kind of fell into two broad camps. Um, the first camp was uh, data sharing agreements written in legalese. So they look very much like legal documents um, with a large amount of text, a large amount of uh, uh, typically organized into statements and sections um, and uh, um, usually kind of uh, organized around big definitions throughout the text. 
the other subcategory um, appears to have grown out instead from the research data management plan sphere, which is kind of the direction that, that I come from as well. Um, and they look more, more like research data management plans to be shared between more than one party. And then everyone essentially signs up for this joint research data management plan. Um, those are broadly the two camps I've, I've seen things fit into, and it's more or less 50-50. Um, uh, but it's interesting that they're kind of coming from such different directions. Unfortunately for me, none of them were Creative Commons licensed. All of the um, all of the data sharing agreement templates that I could find uh, out there online, at least at the time, this was back in 2022, um, uh, were you know all rights reserved, copyright. So no dice on being able to uh, shortcut in that direction. Um, so what instead I did, I'll just go back to my original share. Um, what instead I did was, um, as part of this kind of package of material, um, I developed a new uh, templates that um, I was then happy to make uh, a Creative Commons license. So I'll just stick the um, DOI link uh, up in the chat so that people have it just in case it's useful to um, get access to that. Um, and what we ended up with is this document. So um, I'll just quickly uh, screen share it. it. It's going to be relatively familiar for, from anyone who's ever th uh, put together a, a research data management plan, because that was the format, I guess, that we went for. Um, it's in Swinburne livery, obviously, because we're using it at Swinburne, but it's uh, adaptable. I'll just um, highlight the uh, uh, the licensing information down at the bottom, uh, which is that the template is licensed under Creative Commons um, CC by uh, for license. Um, so if any university out there is in need of a data sharing agreement and wants to uh, as a template and wants to use it as a starting point, they're welcome to. Um, I already linked to the DOI for the um, uh, for the Zenodo repository. This is a live document. Um, so as I gain additional feedback from people, I have been updating it over time. It's now on version 0.2.5, I think. Um, uh, so it's going to be updated over time, but it may at the very least be a useful starting point for um, different groups. And it actually aligns reasonably closely to what's been talked about already in terms of the kind of logical sections for, um, for a data sharing agreement to form. Um, there's a few things that are maybe slightly different to it, so I thought I would highlight those. Um, the first thing is that uh, this is meant to be flexible enough to be used for requesting um, data from a third party into to, to be used within the university and also licensing of data that originated within the university to be shared with a, a third party. Um, Swinburne does do some uh, medical research where we're interacting with hospitals and other clinical research um, institutions, but we do a lot more research with um, private corporations and, and companies. We've got a lot of you know, engineering and technology um, work that goes on here. So that tends to be the focus. Um, and one of the things that comes up in that context is having to be quite specific about um, a project may have multiple data sets. Um, and one thing that can be slightly tricky is that not all of those data sets are going to require the same handling. Um, and the other thing that we've uh, come across is um, in clarity between the original raw data set being provided and derived data sets that are being generated from that. And so that was an, uh, or, or from those. Um, and so that was another thing that we wanted to try and be quite specific around where possible. Um, so some of this is you know, relatively obvious stuff, the start date, end date, the descriptions of those data sets so that we're all clear on which data sets we're talking about, particularly if a project can have dozens of different data sets involved. Um, 
the usual things that side of things in terms of who has access to the data sets, but also um, information about uh, can these data sets be disseminated onto other parties. Um, we have had problems, for example, where um, uh, researchers have um, handed over a data set to an external collaborator, and that external collaborator has used a platform or a tool um, which automatically shares that data on to third parties or, or vice versa, um, which is particularly embarrassing from our point of view when um, uh, we are exposing data to um, third party platforms um, unintentionally. Um, and so it's just worthwhile being clear about um, whether that's intended or not. Um, in terms of storage, actually, this is already a little bit out of date, um, of course, because cloud storage is being decommissioned by the end of this year. So previously, we were more or less the options were cloud store, Nectar, Ozdar, or, or other. Um, uh, particularly, um, uh, particularly being try, uh, asking researchers to be clear with where it's being stored. Now that cloud store is um, uh, being decommissioned, we're likely moving over to using OneDrive for those same functionalities, OneDrive for business for those same functionalities. Um, but in particular, being clear that uh, from the university's point of view, um, data is being stored both encrypted and within Australian borders. Now, this is obviously relevant from uh, for a domestic um, collaboration point of view. If we're talking about an international collaboration, it's entirely possible that data will need a copy of that data would need to be stored externally outside of Australia. But again, from the point of view of uh, university data, most um, most Swinburne, uh, for example, um, informed consent forms uh, around human data will specify that the data is only going to be stored domestically within Australia, because, of course, different countries have very different laws around under what circumstances the government of that country can demand access to uh, your data. Um, if a researcher was, generate, uh, was generating a data sharing agreement for sharing data with uh, a partner internationally, we'd want them to seriously think about what the solution is in that case. The two broad solutions being either, well, okay, in that case, you're enabling encryption uh, data to be stored encrypted outside of Australia, in which case you might need to check in with the ethics office um, to see whether that is sufficiently compatible with your informed consent um, and with expectations of the legal systems of those other countries. Or you can set up a system whereby the only copy of the data, it will still be stored within Australia, but external parties will be able to access that data API into it or something like that without storing a local copy outside of Australia, for example. Um, when we are talking about transfer of data, um, again, a, a common issue we found within the research ecosystem um, is sharing data by email, right? A and I think that that's pretty uh, standard across most universities. The downside of that being, of course, that email is not encrypted which really um, puts a big hole in your security when you're moving something from an in one encrypted server to another encrypted server via an entirely unencrypted intermediate and sort of undermines the entire thing. Um, obviously, uh, that doesn't apply if the files are being manually encrypted using some other system attached to an email and then being received, that's fine, but that is not the typical way in which researchers interact with email attachments. Um, so again, these were our standard um, encryption options within um, within Swinburne. But again, the idea would be that the template could be adapted to whatever the standard um, transfer methods are at different universities. Uh, similarly, uh, and again, you know, this has already been mentioned. You know, what's the what's the intention around the destruction of these data sets? Um, it is pretty common within a university uh, research um, ecosystem for data to be retained way longer than um, it's actually um, intended to be. Uh, one, one of the issues around uh, you know, within the ethics office side of things uh, is already often we're telling participants that 
data is going to be destroyed after a set period of time, um, but actually enforcing that that data is destroyed 15 years after um, uh, after the um, after the project is not trivial. Uh, and the same goes um, in this case, but it, at least it's important to flag the uh, intention. Um, uh, and again, just the standard kind of um, periods of time that one might expect data to be uh, retained for, including the, the concept of indefinite retention. Um, importantly, indefinite retention doesn't necessarily mean permanent retention. Indefinite just means, no, I'm not going to tell you how long because I don't know how long, but at some point I assume I'm going to delete it. Where uh, a statement that it's going to be permanently retained is more in the lines of, you know, talking about open research data and things like that, or data that's going to be important in a patent application where you actually do have to make a commitment that no, 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 we're going to keep this data actually safe and secure um, you know, and permanently archive it. Um, and then the next section is much more in terms of the what is permitted to be done with that data set. So again, something that is common within the research um, sphere is researchers wanting to say, look, I'm happy to share my data with you, but only for certain purposes. I don't, it, this isn't carte blanche to, to do whatever you want with that data set. Um, this necessarily has to be quite freeform. There's so many, you know, potential uses, right? You're not going to have a, a drop down menu or a tick box options for what's going to be done with this data. But there is at least suggestion as to what sort of things we mean in terms of, you know, what sort of derived data sets are you expecting to be using this data for? What is the scope of the project? What other data sets are you going to be combining this with? Um, and similarly, again, we've talked about, well, what was the retention of the original raw data that we initially shared? But um, there's typically a large number of derived data sets that come from that data. So it's not really, you know, the, the spirit of a data sharing agreement, right, is not that you get to get a whole load of raw data, do some trivial manipulation to it to create a derived data set, tell the organization, that's okay, I deleted the raw data, and then keep your derived data set that sort of circumvents the entire process. So being clear around uh, what we're expecting from derived data sets, because um, almost invariably um, those uh, are going to be retained by at least one party and often by both parties. But within a university ecosystem, it's not uncommon for us to, uh, for us to say, well, actually, um, the, the data that we get from you is going to be um, uh, the certain facets of that data is going to be combined with other data sets we have in house and derived data sets are going to be used as part of a publication and as part of our responsibilities around that publication we're going to make that derived data set open access it's very important to be clear about that because that can be a very different um, behavioral expectation compared to a lot of private industry where they uh, if that's not communicated ahead of time uh, a lot of organizations outside of the university ecosystem may be very surprised by researcher um, intentions to be quite so public with they de-identified or agglomerated or, or otherwise um, uh, derived versions of a data set shared with them. Um, and the next couple of sections are very researcher focused and again, typically don't come up in terms of you know, enterprise data sharing agreements. Um, and this is a little bit um, like, a, this is more kind of in common with uh, research collaboration agreements that, that some researchers do to kind of, um, I guess, in a very crude way, prevent uh, arguments over authorship later on. Um, and so broadly, it's talking about what, what outputs are expected from this data and who's going to be authors on those research outputs, the sort of thing that it, it typically isn't relevant to, um, uh, to enterprise data and often isn't thought about from, um, from external uh, industry partners point of view, but can be uh, extremely front of mind from a researcher point of view. Um, and then finally, yeah, we've talked about, you know, we talked about this offboarding deletion process, um, what's gonna be done with these research outputs. Again, 
uh, is the partner expecting, oh yeah, there will be a research output, you are writing a report and you're going to give that report just to us, right? So that was our expectation. It's very different to, oh no, actually we're going to be making uh, a research output that actually is going to be made public, either public and paywalled or public and open access. Um, uh, and also very occasionally some um, partnerships have expected that there'll be some sort of research output that's only going to be retained by one of those parties. I think that this is actually extremely rarely done, but sometimes it's the expectation that a partner can have. So again, uh, yeah, like I've said a million times, it's um, just laying out expectations where possible ahead of time. Um, the human data section is kind of very specific to a, 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 the kind of the ethics office side of um, data sharing agreements. And then it's simply uh, the last section is the signatory section at the bottom, you know, organization, position, name, signature date, um, very basic stuff. So you can see how this is, you know, everything up until that is very much looking like a uh, uh, an ethics application for a research project or a uh, research data management plan within a university context, uh, very little in terms of the legal style of a data sharing agreement. Um, it becomes a little bit more like that with the uh, with a reasonably long definition section, just so that everyone's on the same page as to what exactly we're talking about when we say sensitive or when we say shared. Um, and the only other thing that is relevant in this context is I also put together a little kind of description around the logic of this data sharing agreement. So if you're using this as the starting point within your own university, organization, institute, whatever, um, you can see at least what the thought process was that went, in, went into the way that it currently is. Um, that's going to be useful, more useful for some settings um, than others, but at least it kind of gives an idea of what the, the thought process was behind it. Thomas, um, I'm, I'm just yeah. going to have to cut in there. Um, we're kind of nearing the end of time. So if you've got some just final comments that you'd like to share and then can quickly open it up to see if anyone's got any burning questions for the panel. Well, as you may have guessed from the fact that that's the end of the document, that's also the end of the, the main things that I wanted to say. So I shall unshare now and um, open it up to questions in general no that that was fantastic Thomas so good to see your template and all all the steps that are involved and really good that you've added that um commentary at the end of the document to support in how to kind of complete that and I think people will definitely have a look at that template to help support the development of their data sharing agreements so I just want to open up the floor to the participants here, if anyone's got any burning questions for, for the group, um, we've taken note of the commentary within chat um, around kind of areas of interest and areas of need. So any questions anyone would like to ask? I'll ask a question if no one else will. Okay. Um, for any and all of the presenters, um, have they been approached about um, AI training or um, model training uh, for any of their data, either um, the uh, administrative data or, or otherwise? Because um, as an archive, we have been uh, requesting, uh, have many requests coming to us um, on those grounds. And we're not sure that our regular contracts kind of cover that because they're not sharing the information again, but they are utilizing the information that is tamed to train their model or train their AI, thus kind of on sharing that information. Does that make any sense? So I was wondering if any of the three presenters um, have had similar and data sharing agreements. I'm, I'm happy to briefly comment. So I, I have um, part of my background is in unsu uh, unsupervised machine learning. So I haven't done that much supervised machine learning, but broadly speaking, um, uh, I would say that the, you know, when training a large language model, for example, or some other kind of um, supervised machine learning, the current trend is to call it AI, but it's kind of, you know, it depends on the exact technique. Um, or any other sort of neural network, I, I would say that the, the neural network that you end up with is a derived data set. Um, 
And so that's the sort of thing where you would want to be clear as to the methodology, but the derived data set and how it's going to be used is the sort of thing that the um, original participants should be aware of, because uh, a lot of those sorts of machine learning models, um, you can't extract out of them the exact raw data, but you can extract out significant aspects of that raw data. I can add that um, we've had a couple of data sharing agreements in the um, teaching and admin space uh, that have been not exactly using AI, but say scanning metadata or scanning IP addresses or th that type of information. And certainly have been putting data sharing agreements in place um, because it's, you know, as Thomas has said, it's about you know, who's using the data, what are they using it for, and you know what's what's the output. So um, we've, we have been putting those data sharing agreements in place for those types of scenarios. David, you've got your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, thanks, Thomas. That was a very um, detailed um, document. Uh, I saw there was a reference to authorship, whether authorship of a publication or a document was part of a sharing agreement. But if I remember well, in the Code for Responsible Conduct of Research, only providing data is not enough to be an author. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Um, and so that's one of the things where I, I think that sort of expectation needs to be laid out ahead of time. Um, occasionally, it is the case that uh, as part of data sharing agreement, there's also the expectation to share interpretation and expertise. It's not just the data, it's we're giving you the data so that you could see it and we will be collaborating on this. Okay, yeah. Okay. I think we're coming to time now, so um, I would just like to thank the speakers for the time they've given to present today during this session. It was really informative, really um, inspiring, I would say. I've learned a lot myself. I can see a lot of areas that I would like to kind of work on further to uh, within the ARDC to support the um, universities and organizations with the concept of data sharing agreements. Um, and it's been great to be able to kind of share um, the areas of interest and the work that people have been doing here. And just finally, I just want to apologize about the technical difficulties at the start of this. Sometimes Zoom likes to have a mind of its own. So thank you once again, everyone, for coming along and look out for an, sessions in the future with regards to this sort of information. Thank you again.